Well, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Um, this is our second virtual tree walk of Hessel Park. We really appreciate you uh, joining us this evening. And tonight's topic will be um, native versus non-native. Are there implications for, for either? Uh, so my name is Ryan Panko. I'm a horticulture educator here with Illinois Extension out of Champaign County. Um, I, uh, my formal training is as a forester and arborist, so I feel really fortunate to have been able to have a career of of tree loving and tree identification that I bring to you. And joining me today is one of our East Central Illinois Master Naturalists, Elizabeth Jeffrey. Elizabeth, would you please introduce yourself to the folks? Hello, yes, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I come from England originally, and I was delighted when I got here to find that there are many trees uh, east of the Mississippi that are the same as or similar to trees that I found in England. Okay, let's have the next slide. As you can see, it's still really a, um, a naked tree walk here in the park at the moment. There are very few trees with leaves. Uh, those that do have something in them are, are blossoms. So the, this is a little crab, I think. A, a number of trees have blossoms, but otherwise very few leaves. So you may remember that last time we talked about the maples and the oaks, and at that time the red maple was in bloom, and you see the bloom on the left side of your screen. Now, just a, a few short days later, uh, the blooms are gone and the, um, the seeds have started to form and, and will soon be scattered by the wind. So today we're going to talk about native and non-native, which sometimes are called exotic trees. Um, and uh, you see the yellow star where we are and we'll find out what happens when we grow trees that belong here or trees that belong in other parts of the world originally. And so um, as we take a look at this slide, um, you know, non-natives are often ad advertised as free from pests, meaning, you know, insects don't eat those. Well, um, that's because our, our native insects have co-evolved with a lot of these other plants to, um, to feed on them and, and overcome the defense mechanisms that um, every tree or every plant has some type of defense mechanisms against herbivory. So um, one of the examples that I can, that most of us know of are, is the monarch butterfly and its unique relationship with milkweeds. You know, monarch caterpillars have to feed on milkweeds. So that's a very specific and unique um, relationship. So if the milkweed goes away, um, it's possible that the monarch could become threatened or endangered, like the dragonfly that we show here. Um, another Ryan, Ryan, I'm not seeing that next slide. I'm still stuck on native and non-native. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, I may have got ahead of us a little bit, but um, Elizabeth, did you want, you want to chime in on this one? I think you were actually going to cover this. I think maybe your internet may be a second behind me is what's okay. going on. Sure. So um, we all know the story about the, the monarch um, needing the milkweed in order to lay its eggs. Um, but the monarch isn't um, different from many, many other uh, insects and in fact there are other insects that are losing their habitat. Uh, the Heinz emerald dragonfly is um, uh, endangered here in Illinois and it's because uh, it needs streams uh, that are um, fed by a spring and are not polluted and there aren't very many of those left. Um, and um, if we go to the um, northwest, we find the Douglas fir, and there it supports many, many different kinds of birds and insects. 
But when we bring it here to Illinois, as we'll see, it supports nothing at all. Um, and as you all know, we're starting to lose our um, ash trees here in Illinois. And there are 42 species of Illinois insect that depend absolutely on the ash tree. There are a large number more that can switch to a secondary um, tree and use that. But um, there are going to be a number of Illinois insects that really become endangered um, if we lose our ash tree completely. Um, now there's a, a nice story though about some trees that uh, even if they're not Illinois trees can uh, support some of our insects. If you look up on the top left, you see that the white spruce, spruce tree belongs up in Canada and comes a little bit down, but not as far as Illinois. However, if we turn to um, the times of the woolly mammoth back in like minus 12,000 years, then there were white spruce all over the state. Now, I don't know if it's because the state, the ground has a memory or the tree has a memory or maybe the insects have a memory, but there's a large number of insects like this butterfly here that can actually utilize the spruce tree. And so on that last uh, slide, Elizabeth referenced the days of the woolly mammoth. And you know, that was many, many thousands of years ago. Um, if we look at this larger time scale, um, this kind of describes some of the, the forest genesis or creation of forests in Illinois. So along the top there, uh, we've made little figures that kind of represent past glacial periods in Illinois. So um, 1 million years ago and 600,000 years ago was before the Illinois glacier, which hit 250,000 years ago was, you can see the advancement of the Illinois glacier there outlined in blue. And then this 22,000 years ago uh, was the end of the Wisconsin glacier period. So skipping to the next line down though, if we look at around 24,000 years ago, uh, that Wisconsin glacier start, that was the height of it. It started to recede for the next 2000 years. As that happened and that ice receded, we actually had a uh, boreal forest like you would see up around the Arctic Circle nowadays. So following the retreat of that ice was a pine spruce forest across all of Illinois. Um, you know, then as, as time went on and um, weather and climate changed, uh, deciduous trees started to come up from the south. And that's what about 10, happened about 10,500 years ago. We had uh, deciduous trees migrate in from the south. Um, starting at about 6,500 years ago, though, we had a, a very dry period in Illinois climate. And that actually allowed prairie grasses to start to dominate over trees. So we, that's what drove the development of all the prairies we have. Around 3,500 years ago, that warming climate changed some and, and actually became wetter and, um, and cooled off a little bit and not, hot, not as hot and dry. And so trees take a little bit more moisture than grasses to grow. So that's what brought us to the current day uh, of what we have in Illinois or what we would have had at pre-settlement time for Illinois, which was a mixture of forest and grass. So when we start to talk about this topic of native, uh, not only does a geographic range apply to that, but a time scale does too. So when we look at white spruce, this shows that, you know, uh, thousands of years ago, white spruce actually was a native to Illinois. And so that leads to a discussion of biodiversity. That's one of the most important things we want to protect in our environment these days. And, um, and how do native plants play a role in that? Well, um, insects play a vital role in this because insects are those, uh, the, the lower rung of the food chain. So they, they take the energy from the sun that you can see shining on this little plant in the upper left. Um, that plant takes energy from the sun and transfers that into the animal kingdom by way of insects. So many of those insects feed on leaves and plant parts, and then they are eaten by the rest of the food chain. So that's just an important transition point uh, for our food web, so to speak. But like all of us, insects can be very picky about what they eat. And so we've talked about the specific example of the, of the monarch. Uh, there's a lot of other examples among our native flora and fauna that have these exclusive relationships. So by planting native plants or by having native plants around, 
we're supporting that entire food web by, um, you know, again, supporting um, this lowest rung of it. Um, and so uh, one, one question that folks ask a lot is, is you know, in thinking about trees and shrubs, how, how do all these insects use trees and shrubs? And we're going to talk about that a little bit specifically with some of these species, but uh, there's a number of different ways. Not only do they use them for food, use trees and shrubs for food, either through leaf feeding or uh, wood boring. There's many wood boring insects that use trees and shrubs, um, or they use them for shelter. So, so there's other insects that, um, that use different parts of woody plants for shelter. So there's lots of different things other than just food that insects use um, our native plants for, making them uh, really important. So you remember from last time that we talked about the tools that you have in when you're trying to identify a tree. And we talked about the fact that observation is the biggest tool that you have. And of course, you would have a book in your pocket. And last time we had a book that was Forest Trees of Illinois, but this time we need something more extensive. And so, um, there are a couple of apps that are really, really useful that they will sort of lead you to finding out what, what you're looking at. The iNaturalist or the V-Tree from Virginia Tech. Um, and then there are larger books that have, the Tree Identification Book has a key. Um, I would say that Michael Durr's book on woody landscape plants has everything you could possibly imagine in it. Um, however, it doesn't have a key. So once you know something about your plant, then that's a wonderful um, place to go. Yeah, and I totally agree that Michael Durr's book is just like, you know, the manual to have on woody plants, but you have to be able to get in the ballpark. So you have to be able to get to genus probably, or kind of close to find yeah. your plant in there. So um, great book. But again, like Elizabeth said, probably needs to be backed up with some type of key or some other way to to get in the ballpark. Um, so let's talk for a second about twigs. Um, last, in our last presentation, we talked about uh, looking at twig and bud arrangement. And you know, really both of these programs were, uh, were, Elizabeth and I came up with these as a supplement to what we would have been doing in the field. So um, we would have been looking at you know, naked trees in the field. So trees without leaves in most cases. We'll actually cover some evergreens tonight, but um, twigs are a really important identification feature in, when you don't have leaves. So, here we can see uh, two different bud arrangements. On the left, you can see a black gum twig that has an alternate bud arrangement. So you can see how those buds, are, none of them are across from each other on the twig, where in the center here, we see an ash twig that's actually starting to leaf out. Um, and they're, they are opposite of each other. So those, those buds are just directly across from each other. Uh, some of the other things that we pay attention to though for ID characteristics, and we'll talk about tonight, are also um, the, the relation, where, where the terminal bud is. Um, in the case of oaks and maples that we talked about last time, the oaks usually have a cluster of terminal buds. Um, a lot of times that terminal bud looks different than the lateral buds. They're a little further down the twig. And another thing we'll look at that's really important in a lot of trees for identification is that leaf scar. So the, the mark that that leaf leaves when it falls off the twig can be distinctive for some of these species. Um, so like our last tour, we have a guide this time, uh, Rowan Pankow, my son, he's a three-time junior ranger with the National Park Service. And so we included Rowan um, for a reference of size in, la in our last presentation. So we could see about how big that tree was next to a six-year-old. Well, this time around, Rowan and I brought our, forestry measure our forest measurement stick, uh, a lot of us call a Biltmore stick. Um, and you can see Rowan holding it here, and it's actually a really quick way that you can measure tree diameter. So it's a sighting tool that foresters use in the field and allows you to just rapidly get that, that number for diameter. So as we went around this time around to take some pictures at Hessel, I had Rowan measure each one of these trees and he did it by holding that stick 25 inches away from his face, which in Rowan's case, that's probably not quite his, his reach. That's about perfect for me is 25 inches from your eye. Um, and you line up the left side of the stick, as you can see on the top left there, Rowan's lining up the left side of the stick with the left side of the trunk. And then in the picture to the right here, he's reading the right side of that stick tells him uh, that diameter. It's scaled perfectly to at 25 inches tell you the diameter of that tree. And in the bottom uh, corner there, you see kind of like a little drawing that describes that. So as we go through, I'm going to report um, diameter on each one of these trees that, that Rowan helped me measure and so we can get a, a real true measure of size, not just comparison to, to Rowan. So um, like we did last time, we started at this pavilion here marked by the star. This is um, 
a wonderful map that the Champaign Park District, who owns Hessel Park and, and maintains it, has uh, published that's a guide to all the trees in Hessel Park. So that we used this last time, we're going to use it again. And uh, just like last time, we're also going to use some Google Earth imagery to get us virtually into the park tonight. So this is a view looking to the north where you can see the pavilion that we'd start at. Uh, you can see a lot of some of the trees we actually covered last time, but our first tree is just right around the corner here. We're going to walk up to tree number one, which was a saucer maple, magnolia. Hello. So every spring when I see this tree, I'm just astounded at its beauty. It is gorgeous. Um, but before we get away with, with what it is, I want you to just uh, remember to practice by looking up into the sky and see, can you see whether it's alternate or opposite to see if that's going to help you ID it? No, it's very, very difficult to tell when there are flowers. So there are times when you really have difficulty doing that. And we'll look um, um, shortly at a twig and that's much easier. But before I leave this, I'd like you to look at the name. Sorsa magnolia, magnolia sulangiana with an X in between. And it's an X because it's a cross that's man-made between two Chinese uh, magnolias. And so this is not a native. It's very, very far away from home. And uh, unfortunately, although it's beautiful, it doesn't support any insects whatsoever. So if you look in the middle, you can see the twig that I mentioned, and you can see here that it's alternate. Um, it has a bud on the right, and then on the left, and then on the right. And just in case you think that those two top buds might suggest opposite, if you have an opposite twig, the two buds always develop at the same rate. And you can see here, the right-hand bud is a lot larger, and that proves to you that it's an alternate. We can also see that um, the leaves are large and flat and simple. We can see the trunk is a beautiful gray, smooth trunk. And we can see the fruit on the right-hand side. Now, I've never seen fruit associated with this, with this particular tree or with any tree like this in Champaign-Urbana. And it may be because if you look on the left at the flower, you see there's some frost damage. And so if there's enough frost damage, you wouldn't be able to form fruit. And so if any of you have ever seen fruit forming on this tree, I would love to hear from you afterwards. Uh, but for the meantime, let's look at that frost damage. You can see there are frosted petals lying on the ground at uh, Rowan's feet, and you can see the frosted petals on the trees above. And so the reason that they frost is that although the tree is hardy, the, the flowers come out in March and we almost always get frosts after March. However, in the next slide, we do have a native magnolia. It's called Magnolia acuminata or cucumber tree. Cucumber from the shape of the fruit that uh, you can see a little bit of it developing there in the middle. And this is fragrant flowers, just like the other. Um, you can see on the range map, the native range map that Illinois is included. And uh, the flower doesn't come until late April or even May, and therefore it's very unlikely to get frosted. And so um, that really helps. And it is actually the uh, host plant for a number of beautiful butterflies, including the spice bush swallowtail. Okay, now that brings us to tree number two, which is just kind of around the corner. You can see where we started the pavilion and uh, Rowan and I walked about uh, maybe 30 or 40 yards to this next tree, maybe just a little bit further. Uh, but the next tree on the list was sweet gum. And so 
you know, if you look at the upper left, uh, it's, you know, the first thing I usually do, direct folks to do in the field is again, look for opposite versus alternate, because that's a very distinctive thing we can tell about these trees. Um, and I've zoomed in and used um, uh, this, this uh, orange arrow should be kind of connected to that sweet gum ball. But if you look up here, we can see, um, you know, the opposite, the alternate branching pattern on this tree. So that would tell us it's not all those, the, that small group of trees that falls in the opposite branching pattern. And I think probably any of us that have ever been around a sweet gum will remember those fruits, those, those spiky round balls there. You can see Rowan found a bunch of those on the ground. That's a, that's a major ID feature. And even again, in this park that's well maintained and mowed and cleaned and, and kept very clean, you can still find some sweet gum balls this time of year because they kind of drop all through the winter. So, um, so anyway, uh, we, we again measured diameter on this one and got about 19 inches for this sweet gum. So that's a pretty, pretty uh, mature size sweet gum there. Um, and so now this is probably one of the ma main identification features in the fall is just sweet gums, absolutely beautiful color. We're gonna see another native tree that probably is the only one I know of that can rival the fall color display of a sweet gum, but it's just every color in the rainbow, even, even some purple sometimes included on the same tree. So just absolutely beautiful and stunning uh, fall display. So that's probably the main argument, although we hate those gumballs, which a lot of animals love, although we hate those gumballs and everybody wants to get rid of their sweet gum, I always argue it is so beautiful in the fall, it's worth keeping. And I would, I would always keep one at my house if I had one. Um, so uh, although sweet gum doesn't, it doesn't support a ton of insects compared to other native plants, like some of our oaks that support literally hundreds and hundreds, uh, it does, it does su support about 30 species of moss and butterflies, uh, some in their, in their larval stage like we see here. Uh, but also birds, birds and mammals feed on those seeds in the seed pods. So that's probably a pretty important function it serves for um, our native wildlife. And if you look at the range map at the right there, uh, folks, folks that may be tuning in from Southern Illinois, this tree is native too, but where I'm sitting at in Champaign, it doesn't quite, we're just slightly outside of its native range. So although it's an Illinois native, it's not necessarily native to Champaign County where I'm at. So grows well here, uh, does, wonderful in Champaign. I could show you plenty of healthy sweet gums, but again, not necessarily native to this part of the state. And so now let's continue on our walk down the beautiful path. And this is one of the just great things at Hessel Park is that it has this nice, nicely paved accessible pathway that folks can access this trail and, and check out all the trees. So uh, we had to jog around the park a bit uh, to tree number seven. You can see that highlighted in the left there in the Google Earth image. And I think Elizabeth was going to talk about black gum. Yes, uh, the black gum is a wonderful tree in my mind. Um, it has actually a couple of other names that you might know it by, uh, Tupelo or Pepperidge. Up in Michigan, where I know the black gum very well, uh, it's called Pepperidge. And so let's look up at the branches and see, is it alternate or opposite? And here it's very, very clear that it's alternate and so that really helps. Um, and also if you look at the twig in the middle you can see that zigzag shape and that is also a very very easy way to tell that a twig is, is op alternate rather than opposite. Now it's too early for the flowers, the flowers are not yet out um, and they're not very remarkable flowers when they come, they're just little, little bits and pieces. Um, and um, there are wonderful uh, furrows and ridges on the uh, trunk that you can see there. And um, Ryan tells me that that's because the cambium layer just underneath the bark is, is growing and pushing that bark out. And so it breaks a little. Um, and creates a unique pattern for each tree species. We kind of talk about this on our last uh, tree hike, but That's right. yeah, it's, it's a distinctive pattern. And on this next slide, we'll see it a little closer up. Um, but yeah, wonderfully ornate bark. Yes. And so this black gum, uh, not pr related to the sweet gum in any way at all. Uh, this is Nyssa sylvatica. Uh, goes absolutely magnificent colors in the fall. And one of the reasons is because the leaves are shiny. They're simple, they're relatively small. They're, they're mm, what, three to six inches, 
but they are shiny and they're gorgeous color. Um, that tree on the left is a mature tree because the one that in the park is little. So I wanted to show you what a mature tree is like. And in the middle, you see the fruit. And the fruit is very fatty. And so uh, not just the squirrel, but also a lot of birds, particularly just before they migrate, love to eat these and get the energy from them. And up in Michigan, even the bear will eat them before he hibernates. Now let's look at that range. And you see that just like the sweet gum, it's only the very tippy bottom of Illinois that the black gum is native to. But it's nothing to do with temperature because look, Indiana is covered. Indiana is, is cooler, but it grows black gum just fine. And I've told you up in Michigan even. And so what we're left with assuming is that it's due to the different soil. Remember how that Illinois glacier came in and how we got the prairie in Illinois? The Indiana people would like to, um, the Hoosiers would like to tell you that they have a little prairie, but they actually have very little prairie. Um, they have very different soil to us. And so maybe that's why the black gum grows so well there. Um, before we leave, sorry, there are about 25 different uh, Lepidoptera um, butterflies and moths that depend upon the black gum. Okay, so then we uh, kept moving, but uh, just right around the corner here, you can see is tree eight uh, and uh, is actually one of the larger trees on our walk tonight. Elizabeth, I think you're going to talk about this one too. Oh, yes, certainly. This is the Douglas fir. And if you're friendly with it, then you call it Doug fir. Um, Doug fir has a very strange um, naming history. If you look at that, it's got a dash between the Douglas and the fir because it's not a fir. It's sort of similar in some ways to a fir, and so it's called Douglas fir. And if you look at the Latin name, pseudo suga, well, pseudo, of course, means not real, and uh, stu suga means hemlock, and it's not a hemlock either. Um, Douglas went up north west of the US to find this um, back in the late 1800s. And he found a man called Menzies, see the name there? And Menzies had um, identified this as a new species and Douglas then um, took it from Menzies and carried it back to England and um, gave it to England to, to grow there. And it grows very well there. So it's a strange thing about the name. Uh, like the fir, it has uh, relatively short, flat uh, needles, but the way to really recognize Douglas fir is that it's got this raggedy, raggedy cone, and we'll come to that and, and look at it in detail in the next slide. After I've asked Ryan, would you like to tell us something about the sap coming out of this Douglas, Douglas fir? trunk? Sure, and um, this fir, this uh, tree trunk was covered in sap, and you know that's usually coming out of the trunk from a wound, from a crack, from insect feeding, from sap suckers, just absolutely love white pine that we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, but in this case I think it actually was a crack. You can almost see, I, I think folks can probably see my mouse here, uh, that's, that's letting some of this, this sap come out, and that's, you know, again, a defense mechanism of the tree that it's putting out this sap to stop infection from coming in, but another cause for that could be a trunk canker. And that's, although Douglas fir doesn't get it quite as often as Colorado blue spruce, uh, another non-native that really has Cytopspora canker bad um, in Illinois, um, that it does get it and that could be a cause of some of the sap oozing. So I know I get this question a lot, um, there's sap oozing down my tree trunk and you know, is there, anything I can do to stop this. And in a lot of cases, um, there's not a wonderful cure for a lot of these trunk cankers that may cause this, if it is a disease or a pathogen. And it's just basically good, good tree health care, uh, mulching and watering during the hot time of the year, 
um, and just and taking good care of that tree, not disrupting its root zone and things are, are some of the recommendations for that. But in this, in the case of our Douglas fir, I don't think there was actually a disease pathogen. I think it was possibly a crack or some kind of wound that was uh, causing that sap. And it, and it is pretty unsightly and folks notice that quite a bit. Um, usually ask questions about that. Okay, so here's the fir cone that I wanted to tell you about. The Douglas fir is a very, very tall tree. In fact, it's second only to the redwood out on the Pacific coast. There's another fir, Douglas fir, that grows in the Rockies that's not quite so tall, but this one can grow 250 feet. And there's a story that one day there was a very big fire and so all the animals were running away from the fire and the mouse ran up the tree and hid inside the Douglas fir cone and managed to escape the fire. But in so doing, his tail and his hind legs sort of stuck out a little bit. And so here you see um, an easy way to remember Doug fir is that the mouse is hiding uh, as they're really bracts under the scales uh, of the Douglas fir cone. And that truly is a distinctive feature. There's not another cone that we're ever gonna see that has bracts similar to that. So um, Rowan and I were able to pretty easily find cones. So that's always, if you, if you see a tree that you're suspecting could be Douglas fir, look for those cones. That's gonna always, gonna always tell you. Uh, so now we continued around the path to actually tree number 10 then on the Hessel Park tree tour. Um, and that tree was a white spruce. So we've already talked about this plant a little bit in reference to the fact that it a long time ago used to be native to Illinois. So it actually does support a good number of uh, wildlife species. There's 150 butterflies and moths that actually utilize this tree. So uh, pretty important to insect species. There's 13 wood boring insect species that use this tree at one point in their life cycle. So supports a ton of insect life, although it's not native to our area. Uh, this particular tree we measured at about 20 inches, so that's a pretty good sized tree. You can see the small kind of papery cones, is how I've always described those, um, so different than our Douglas fir, um, and that it doesn't have those bracts, but in small pa papery um, uh, features on the, on the cone. Um, if we were to actually go ahead and touch those, those needles on, in this case, they are prickly and they would actually hurt for, by, by touching them, whereas the Douglas fir that we just looked at wouldn't hurt that bad. It'd be hard to get, get poked too hard with that. And, and we'll talk about maybe another conifer too that, that doesn't have prickly needles, but um, that's kind of an identification feature for me, at least on uh, white spruce. Okay, and so heading around the corner, we skipped a couple trees to move on up to tree number 14 on the tour. This. Uh, you can see it pictured there, kind of a larger mature tree, and it was a white pine I think Elizabeth is going to talk about. Yes, and I think you all know the eastern white pine because it grows all over the place here, and that's fortunate for the insects because whereas the Douglas pine fir that we looked at earlier doesn't support any critters at all, probably because he lives He's, his range is so far northwest, nothing to do with here. But this, the eastern white, white pine, um, you see, if you look at the range, it sort of dribbles into Illinois and it grows very, very well in Illinois and it supports over 200 different species of butterfly and moth. And here you see the emperor moth. Isn't he a magnificent fellow? Now, it also gives food for mammals, and if you look, uh, not at the bottom left where I've lined up some cones, but the next one over where I lined cones and then put the parts that had been eaten off the cones to give these funny little, just a uh, central, you might call it a ratchet, I guess, I don't know, um, because there were scales all over the area underneath the pine tree because the squirrels and other small mammals love to eat the uh, seeds out of the pine cones. Now, there are two pine trees that you might have seen growing around here. Our eastern white pine that we just spoke about 
and the red pine. But the red pine, although um, its, its range is not terribly different, it's a little further north and the red pine doesn't cope very well with the hot summers of Illinois. And so there are a number of differences. One of the things that I love about the red pine is that um, it drops a few branches here and there, it grows a few un unwieldy branches here and there. So it's not that very um, uh, systematic growth that you have on the white pine. And you can see the white pine here on the left with, with the rings of, of branches that come off very systematically. Um, but there's a big difference. The white pine has essentially no red in its trunk. The red pine has a lot of red in that bark that you can see. The white pine has these long, narrow um, pine cones. The red pine has harder, smaller, rounder pine cones. The white pine has a bundle of five needles. The red pine has just two needles in the bundle. And so it was in 2012 to 2014 that we had um, a drought and all around Champaign-Urbana, we saw the red pine die. And in fact, on my property, my husband had grown 60 white pine that are still all there and happy, and 40 red pine, and there were only three left. They all died because they couldn't take that hot, dry drought. So just kind of an example of getting out of your home range in the case of the red pine and just not being able to handle our climate. But um, yeah, pro and probably this, this slide does a good job of kind of showing both species side by side. And for me, I think it always comes down to those needle bundles. So counting the needles in the bundle on a pine tree. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about on this slide here. Okay, first of all, the needles, yes. Um, you know, a fur is just like the animal fur. It's soft and flat and it feels really good. Um, the Douglas fir, I think that's where it got the dash fir in its name, because those are also soft and flat, although they're typically shorter than the uh, true fir. The spruce, on the other hand, as Ryan told you, is pricky. It's very difficult to grab that twig because it hurts, but if you pull off from that um, little peg, if you pull off one needle, then you find that it's got like four sides that are similar enough that you can actually roll it in your fingers. And the pine needles are the same way. You can roll them in your fingers, but the pine needles are longer and they come in bundles. And so it's very easy and they're much softer. There's some of them are pricky at the end, some of them are not, but they're not hard and harsh the way that the spruce is. Yes, you'll definitely know it if you touch a, if you run into a spruce. Yes. And then the other thing is, uh, this is a strange one. The fir cones stand up. If you look up to the top of the tree, very often there's a gathering of cones up there. You can tell it's a fir because the cones are standing up. Whereas for the spruce, the pine, and the Douglas, Douglas fir, all of them hang down. And I've been trying to think of a mnemonic to remember that the fir stands up and the others hang down. And if you can think of one that's not too rude to use, please send it to me. And that brings us to our next tree. So we walked around the corner from tree 14 there to tree 18, which is a much larger, very mature tree a green ash. So Rowan measured that at 42 inches. This is our largest tree on the tour tonight. Um, so taking a look at the twigs up at the left, you can pretty easily see that opposite arrangement, especially out of the tips. I can see those oppositely arranged twigs. Um, and even further back the limb, as I look further down the limb to find again, as we talked about last time, you always want a few different spots of the canopy where you see either the opposite or alternate to kind of confirm it because some trees can 
actually try to trick you um, and, and may look opposite or alternate in certain areas, but not in others. So you really can see the opposite branching well there. And you can see all the flowers of the ash tree were just starting to emerge. That's a picture down in the bottom left. Um, and behind Rowan, that big trunk um, usually has a very characteristic diamond shaped pattern that I, we've blown up a section of that. So you can kind of see that diamond shaped pattern here. But to me, that, that, that isn't a characteristic ash looking trunk at the view that we're seeing uh, right now. Whereas down in the left hand corner here, you can really see that kind of characteristic, um, you know, diamond shaped pattern of an ash tree. So if we did have leaves, we'd see in the upper left there, um, a compound leaf with usually just five to seven leaflets for green ash. So um, that's a little bit, we're going to look at white ash in a minute that would maybe have a few more, but might have the same amount. So that gets a little bit confusing, but the twig in the center, if we didn't have leaves, would show us that, op that opposite bud arrangement. And then finally, um, we have some uh, Samaras, similar to the maple hel helicopters, are the fruits. And so in this case, there's a little bit of difference in the arrangement of the Samaras where um, uh, we'll, we'll look at that on, on white ash in a second, but this is a very you know, symmetrical looking uh, Samara there. So uh, very kind of elliptical and oval and symmetrical looking. So um, you can see the green ash just has a massive range. It's the entire Eastern US. Um, it, it certainly is one of those generalist tree species where um, in a forested setting, we talked about last time, you might be able to tell from where you're at on a slope or where you're at in nature, what, what type of species you're looking at. That's very true for green and white ash. White ash is going to only be in the uplands. We'll talk about that in a minute. Green ash is going to be in the bottom ones, but it's also a generalist where it can, it can spread up the slope a little bit. It can, it can handle some varying conditions. So that's made it really a, a, a pretty good urban tree. It handles a lot of tough, harsh urban conditions that we throw at it. So uh, we see this pretty commonly as an urban tree. And I don't know that it's necessarily because it's planted. It may be because it grew naturally there and was allowed to mature in that spot. But um, anyway, as I kind of alluded to, our next stop on the tour here is tree 19, which is pretty close and is a white ash. So Again, we can pretty easily see from the buds um, that opposite arrangement. We can see from the twigs um, that opposite arrangement. So a lot of signs there for Rowan and I that this was, you know, in fact, the white ash we were looking for. Uh, only measured at about 19 inches, which actually is a pretty good size for an ash tree, but um, not as big as its super mature green ash cousin that's close there. Um, a pretty similar range to green ash, so the two of them do overlap. Um, and, you know, both of these being native trees and native to such a large area do support a ton of insect life. Um, you know, we, Elizabeth and I found up to 150 different species of caterpillars that rely on this tree at one stage or another of, of their life uh, to do something. So, so that's a pretty huge number. That's a lot of insects, insect life that we support. But um, on that topic of insect life, um, it does support a non-native exotic insect that has came to the U.S. And, if you've paid attention to trees at all in Illinois, you probably have heard of the emerald ash borer. Um, it's very, it's sadly, it is probably eliminating all of our, uh, it's, it's making all of our ash functionally extinct from the ecosystem at some point. Um, it was introduced in Detroit in 2002. Um, and, and we've, we as humans have rapidly spread up the dispersion of emerald ash borer by moving firewood and other materials that can get on around a lot. And so by 2006, it reached Chicago. I think it was in the central part of the state here by about 2010 or 2012, it started to show up here. And now really this map's a little dated as, as at 2018, but it's, I think it's probably in just about every county now in Illinois. Uh, and, and, you know, not as prevalent in the south, southern part of the state yet, but uh, what happens with this insect is it, it feeds on the, the cambium layer of the tree or the, the, the veins and arteries of the tree where uh, the larval stage of this beetle just eats away in there. You can see those galleries on the right. And so that essentially kills the tree by cutting off the top part of the plant from its roots by cutting off all those veins and arteries. So interestingly, a native species or several native species of woodpeckers are eating that larva. So it's, it's one way that um, that's you know, research has shown that slowed the spread of emerald ash borer. It's not ever going to stop it, but um, in areas of high emerald ash borer infestation, you can see a lot of woodpecker activity. And that uh, picture in the center at the bottom there shows what we call blonding of the bark. So that's where those woodpeckers have 
pecked away that bark and, and you know, started to basically label that tree as emerald ash borer infested. So uh, really sad story, but something to be aware of, aware of. And especially if you have an ash tree, you need to probably be watching it for that. Um, I did add a slide here that shows the characteristic D-shaped exit hole that that larva makes as it comes out and emerges. Um, but probably before you would ever see that, you might probably start to see dieback and other things in your ash tree. So if you have an ash tree that's not looking well, this is likely the culprit. And um, sadly, it's probably going to not last too long. And with that, we'd like to talk a little bit about distinguishing between green and white ash. And I know um, that's been, in, in my career as a forester, that has been um, a, a distinguished, you know, a, a distinction I've tried to make often and uh, not so much in the woodlands again because I knew from location, but in an urban area, I always had to kind of look at twigs to get down to species. That was my main, you know, mechanism for this because like we talked about, the number of leaflets can be about the same on both of these um, where uh, the twigs are distinctive. And if you look at the bottom left, um, the white ash's um, leaf scar, so remember we talked about those when we looked at the twig diagram, is in a U shape around the bud. So the bud is nestled down into that leaf scar, where the green ash at the right, that bud sits on top of the leaf scar. So they make two different, pretty distinct uh, shapes. And I've been able to find this even on a dead twig that's been laying there for a year or two. You can still kind of find this leaf scar and that shape. And so the way I've always remembered that from the time I learned this in college in dendrology class was uh, the white ash's leaf scar is U-shaped. That's closer to W in the alphabet than the G for green ash. And so the white ash is U-shaped, but leaf scar is how I've always remembered it. Now, Elizabeth, you have some other points on this. I, I always love to hear other ways other folks think about all this. Well, I do. You know, I, I hope it's still necessary for us to know the difference between green and white ash and that they don't disappear. But what I love about the green and white ash is the story that I heard. If you look at the um, top left, you see the green um, leaf. And if you look just below that, you see the white leaf. Now there's a big difference. The green leaf, the leaflets are standing out flat because there are very, very short stems or petiolules between the leaflets and the ratchets. But it, with, the, with the white ash, they're much longer. And so that means that they actually fall down. It doesn't stay flat. Okay. And so the story that I remember about this is that the, the bride wears white and she's got beautiful, long, slim legs. Not only that, but if we turn to uh, Ryan's uh, scars in the bottom one, you see that the, the bride, the wearing white, has a big smile on her face, whereas the groom is a little uncertain of what's going on. And so um, he's got rather a grim face and it's certainly not a smile. And then if we look at the fall colors, we see that they're both yellow. However, the bride has this wonderful pink color that she goes. We call it the blushing bride. And the green ash doesn't do that at all. And so it's the bride and groom that help me remember the difference between these two. And, and the last thing on this slide is you see a kind of half dead ash tree with a lot of little sprouts along the trunk. And um, sadly, that's a result. That is a characteristic emerald ash borer infested tree that you know the top has been killed by the, boar, by the larva. And that tree's got, it, got its last burst of energy is in all those sprouts that it's put along the trunk. So um, sadly, in this day and age, that's almost an identifying feature of ash trees is uh, some of those, it's called epicormic branching along the, the trunk or a lot of dieback in the canopy can I, almost identify ash in a park setting like this. And you know, Ryan, that brings us to a really, really sad point that although you mentioned there are like 150 um, butterflies and moths that depend upon the ash tree. Many of them have a secondary tree they could turn to, but there are actually 42 Illinois native insects that depend only on the ash. And so they may well become endangered. Well, and so that brings us to our next tree that was just kind of right around the corner from that, tree number 21 on the tour. 
and um, that was a ginkgo tree. Ah, uh -huh. yes, the ginkgo. Um, well, this time I'm going to ask you to look up, but I'm going to expect you to see something rather different. Um, the ginkgo has these little spurs off all of the twigs and the leaves um, and the fruit grow out of the spurs. And so as you look up, you can see the spurs back and forth, back and forth, all the way along. Sort of a little bit like the spurs that you see on an apple tree. Um, and on the right bottom, you see the leaf. Of course, the leaf isn't there at this time of year. Um, but you can see the little indent in the um, middle of the top of the leaf. And um, that is where the ginkgo gets its biloba name from because it looks like it's going to be two lobes. Now this tree is said to be the oldest tree that we know of, 250 million years old. It comes from China and um, in China it's used, um, it's, it's so beautiful it's used around temples. Let's have a look at the next slide and see how beautiful it is. There, in the fall, it goes just this gorgeous, gorgeous golden color. And then the leaves begin to fall. And then when all the leaves have fallen, they fall in a relatively short period of time. And so you get uh, this golden shadow around the base, which I think is wonderful. Now the ginkgo is dioecious. And so the male flowers on one tree will send pollen to the female flowers on another tree and those will develop into fruit. And unfortunately, when that fruit drops, it stinks. To me, it smells a little like vomit. And wouldn't you know, I used to have my office just uh, above the door where there was a female ginkgo just outside and the students would traipse through this and come up to the office and I could hardly stand it. <laughs> but the ginkgo is foreign. It comes from China. It's been adopted in many ways by Japan who love the shape of the leaves, but it doesn't support any species of insect here in Illinois at all. And for that reason is like pest and disease free you know, if you, if you look it up in Durr's annual, it, there's no pester disease that, that messes with ginkgo, at least on this continent. So, um, you know, good, good and bad to all that. But um, that brings us to our next tree, uh, tree number 22 on the hike. And um, we can see this one from a distance. It's a little off the path, but um, it's a Chinese chestnut. And how I always recognize chestnuts is by their bark. And I know it annoys a lot of beginning tree ID folks when you say, um, I can tell that tree by the bark because that is a, a difficult one to do. But uh, this one does have really long, narrow furrows that, that go up and down the trunk and stick out quite a bit. And if you look at this and ID it, identify it a couple times, you'll be able to start to pick out uh, chestnut bark, I think. But what we were able to find that was, um, I, I think you can almost always find, is a husk of the nut. And you can see down there at the bottom in Roan's hand, uh, we picked up the, that spiky husk, and in certain places that's a nuisance because it is spiky and sharp, and if you step on it, it could hurt. Uh, but um, something you can almost always find is an identifying feature, and then at the right there, you see the um, actual nuts that were still in it. We couldn't find a single nut anywhere the day that we were there, and that's because wildlife have probably consumed a lot of it. Um, and so this kind of, this picture kind of shows in the middle uh, a chestnut in flower. So that's really a beautiful sight. And I know Elizabeth and I were kind of trying to watch it this spring to see if we could, or thinking about that, that we wanted a picture of this. That's not the tree in Hustle Park, but um, actually a really great flowering display for um, a nut bearing tree. Um, one, so this is Chinese chestnut, obviously not native to the US, uh, but one way to differentiate from our native chestnut um, is with the twig. So there's a fuzzy twig at the left there that um, would tell us this is Chinese chestnut over our native. Um, if we had leaves, you can see the, the sharp, po the pointy teeth on the, on the uh, leaf edge um, are a pretty distinctive feature among other trees that you might confuse it with. 
And then Elizabeth, did you have a little bit to add about um, the folks that eat these nuts? Oh, the deer? This is, a, this is a deer, the deer love it. And so unfortunately what you'll find is that a lot of hunters are, are planting Chinese chestnut or a cross between Chinese and American so that the deer will come and eat the nuts. Um, and so that brings us to a short discussion of American chestnut. And so a lot of us probably have not ever seen an American chestnut. Um, I think I've identified maybe one in my career that wasn't at an arboretum. Um, and so that's because uh, chestnut, um, chestnut blight is a non-native fungal pathogen that was brought here in 1904 to the East Coast, uh, to New York City. And just by 1950, there's, there's really good maps that show the progression, but just rapidly swept across our continent and pretty much wiped out chestnuts. So I think of emerald ash borer as the insect equivalent of a modern day chestnut blight in, in what it's doing right now, where um, that's an insect moving around. This was entirely a pathogen that moved on its own. Um, it was windblown and just went tree to tree and um, infected those chestnuts and just really virtually wiped them out. So uh, since the 50s, since even before then, we've been trying to find something to replace the chestnut. Uh, some way to cross it with the Chinese chestnut or some way to get breed some natural resistance into it. So, um, and the reason being it was both culturally and economically incredibly significant to the eastern deciduous forest. It was probably the, the best timber species that was available, uh, produced bountiful nuts. There are stories about folks harvesting those nuts in Appalachia and using that basically as currency to go into town and, and buy things with those nuts at the local general store you know, lo a long time ago. I love that just um, great historic look at it. Um, and so along with that importance to us as humans, there is a great importance to wildlife. And so that's why there's a lot of interest in trying to restore it. Um, today, uh, we've not really been successful. We've, we've been successful at crossing with Chinese chestnut in different ways to get a resistant tree that cannot get blight and can grow in an urban setting or in a place that we plant it but they just aren't quite competitive out in nature. And so that's kind of like the, the key to restoring chestnut is finding those right genetics that could compete in nature. So interestingly, a recent development with technology on the chestnut is that um, some scientists have actually genetically modified chestnut by putting in a, a gene from wheat that offers resistance to this fungus. And they've created what we think may be uh, the right genetics in a chestnut that it could compete in nature. Now, interestingly, that is still awaiting FDA approval, and it's somewhat controversial that we've genetically modified a tree species. And so um, it's something I've, I've been trying to follow the news closely, so, so watch that. We probably will be hearing something in recent year, in, in coming years here, as to whether that patent for that GMO is approved or not, and whether this tree can, can function in nature or be restored, so. But, but Ryan, before you leave it, uh, you know, everyone talks with such passion about the American chestnut, but we're here in Illinois. Now look at that range map and you see that the American chestnut really never got into Illinois. And maybe that's why if you come to Decatur, to the Governor Oglesby's mansion, in the backyard, there is an enormous American chestnut. And I think that it was planted and I think it was too far away from any other to suffer from the fungus. Yeah, and there's some interesting stories of isolated specimens like that, that, that can somehow not get infected or, or maybe they have that, those, that, those genetics that could unlock the key to chestnut blight resistance. But yeah, really interesting. So I didn't know we had one right here in Central Illinois that we could look at. Uh, so that brings us to our next tree, just a short little jog, Rowan and I cut across the grass. We didn't even go back to the sidewalk for this one. So tree number 24, the yellow buckeye. Elizabeth, I know this is one of your favorites out of the- It is. I love the buckeye and I actually have a buckeye in my yard that I grew from seed. Um, if we try to remember to look for, is it opposite or is it alternate? I think that you can't look up to the top of this tree because it's too far away. However, if you look at the twigs, then you'll see that it's opposite. And so then I would ask you to remember mad buck and the fact that buck stands for the buckeye. 
And so here we are with the yellow buckeye that has opposite buds and the buds are great big juicy buds that then when they break open you can see a leaf coming out but you can also often see the flower emerging as you can in the top right there. One of the magnificent things about the yellow buckeye is the color it goes in the fall. It is brilliant orange. However, those leaves don't stay on for very long. It's a very short, um, beautiful happening, and then it's over. Uh, the fruit, you can actually quite easily tell the difference between a yellow buckeye and uh, the Ohio buckeye, because the yellow buckeye has a smooth covering, and the Ohio buckeye is prickly. You know, we're back to thinking about the Ohio people maybe being prickly people. But the other thing is that the Ohio buckeye has leaves that stink. If you rub that leaf, it looks relatively similar. I won't go into the differences, but it stinks. Um, I've got a picture of a squirrel here eating the buckeye. The buckeye is toxic, but surprisingly, the squirrel and no other mammal is known to eat this buckeye. You see that the arrangement here, um, the range map shows uh, that the yellow buckeye grows in the Appalachians. And one can't help wondering, is this going to change with climate change? And are we going to see that native range move? Because native is just native today. Well, and that brings us safely back to the pavilion to end our tree tour of Hessel Park. But we certainly thank you guys for joining us. And Elizabeth found this wonderful picture of this artwork that I just absolutely love. Do you mind describing that to folks, Elizabeth? Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful tree um, drawn by Anita Zymolka. And if you look carefully, you can see many, many different creatures that are dependent upon this tree. And that's really what we need to remember when we talk about native and not native. What are we going to do with the creatures that are dependent upon our native trees? And so we've listed our contact info on this uh, slide here. We got a lot of great feedback from folks the last time around. And I'll say again, um, I'm happy to share this uh, PowerPoint as a PDF. If folks want to shoot us an email, we'll get that out to you. Um, one other bit of housekeeping, uh, we do have a recording just almost ready to post to YouTube and we will email anybody that registered for this tree walk or the last one with the recording of both our last tree walk and this one as soon as we can get it um, edited and ready for the internet. So um, with that, I think we probably have quite a bit of stuff that's came into the chat box. We'll, we'll spend a few minutes here and take a few of those questions and I think um, we have Amanda on to maybe read a few of those or she's been keeping track while you all have been entering that. Thanks for the interaction. We appreciate that. Hi, everybody. It's Amanda. All right. So we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one, um, is the magnolia without fruit because no insects visit to pollinate? Oh, what a good question. I forgot to ask you, does this tree look as though it's insect pollinated or wind pollinated? You remember that we thought about the maples as wind pollinated because the, the uh, stamens stuck out and the flowers were very, very tiny. Now we've got the opposite situation. It obviously would like um, to be pollinated um, by bees or other insects. And the bees and insects might take pollen from any tree, whether it's exotic or native. But what they won't do, the insects won't um, lay their eggs on a foreign tree because they're afraid that their caterpillars won't be able to eat those leaves that they don't know anything about. And so the answer is yes, it should be um, insect pollinated. Um, and I think that the insects will visit it. It has a sweet smell, but um, if it freezes, then uh, it can't develop properly. Yeah, I, th I think I agree with that definitely, that it's probably driven more by cold than lack of pollination. Um, yeah. 
we have other native species that are flowering at the same time. There's, there's insect activity I've seen on um, magnolias, but um, especially a little further south in here where they start to wake up earlier, um, winter is a big issue for these plants. And um, winter kill can happen because they start to come out of dormancy much earlier in the south. So I'm, you know, I'm talking a couple climatic zones south of here and um, can really be zapped by a cold spell where here, if we got that same cold at that same time, our magnolias haven't woke up yet and started to come out of dormancy and aren't susceptible to the cold yet. So um, to me, that's at least in, in my experience with magnolias, I would probably blame that more on cold temperatures than I would um, lack of pollination. I agree. Yep. All right, so the next question is, what is the mature size of a tupelo? Oh, good question. Um, I'm trying to think. I guess it must be about 100 feet. And, and dependent on the site, you know, um, it, especially in a forested setting. Uh, you know, one thing I looked at as a forester before I ever entered the woods was what kind of soil type am I in? And that, of course, dictates the height. But yeah, I think they can easily reach 100. I'd say as, a, as an urban tree, I kind of picture them a little shorter because we're yeah. probably not in a great soil. But um, yeah, it's, it could be as tall as 100. That, that, that picture that I showed you was actually next to a lake in Michigan. And I'm pretty sure that they get to 100 there. I've never used my Biltmore stick. I don't own a Biltmore stick. I better get one. <laughs> and then I could answer that question. All right. Um, OK, so the next one is, do white pine pine cones have a sticky surface? Have a sticky surface? Sticky. Yes, they, they, they do. If you gather them up, your fingers have, have sticky stuff all over them. Ryan, what is that? Uh, well, I think it's just sap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know that I have a better explanation than other than it being sap, but yeah. Um, my white pine, I have one in my front yard, just had a bumper crop of uh, pine cones and before it started to snow this fall I went out and get, gathered up a big box of them for decoration making leaves whatever and I experienced that firsthand literally uh, my hands were <laughs> sticky after that so um, I think it's just sap I don't know I've never really read much about what um, any details so mm -hmm. all right moving on are there um, are the ash trees on this walk being treated for emerald ash borer? If so, what is being used? Um, I don't think so. And you know, when Rowan and I were there, I took a little more pictures of the white ash in particular. That I mean, almost certainly has the ash borer. Um, I don't know. It, it's you know, Champaign Park District does take really good care of their trees and and has a very active arboriculture program. So it could be that green ash has been treated. It, it really looked well. It was, um, it obviously wasn't leafed out when we were there, but I could see all the branches had buds where uh, the white ash had buds that were opening up where the white ash was missing some. So um, as far as the question of what, what would the treatment be, um, there are chemical treatments available where you can, it's a systemic herbicide, pesticide. So you know, the tree takes it up, it's in its material, and it stops the feeding by those um, larvae. But the problem with that is that oftentimes when somebody contacts an arborist to get the treatment, it's because their tree is already showing significant dead. And so that's been my biggest, you know, advice to folks as an arborist is if you have that high value ash tree that you really want to save uh, with chemical treatment, do it now. Don't wait to see the symptoms because a lot of times by the time I ever got called as an arborist, um, the symptoms would be too far along to um, actually have effective treatment. So it needs to happen regularly and early, and um, there's a number of different ways you can apply it. A soil drench is one way, um, a trunk injection is another way, but uh, really is probably something that's kind of out of the scope of a normal homeowner, what you would do. You're probably gonna have to hire an arborist or a professional um, to, to do that treatment for your tree. but and if you, can't, if you can't afford that, maybe you'll be as lucky as me. I have a number of ash trees and I looked out of my window the other day and I saw two pileated woodpeckers at the same time and they are just gorgeous. And you know, they're, they're really tall. They're, they're oh, 14, 15 inches tall. They're gorgeous things. Yeah, so um, 
wildlife definitely use those, those dying ash trees. Um, that, that's great. That goes right into our next question that says, uh, do you recommend cutting down a dead ash tree if it still is sprouting or leaving it for the birds and insects? I think, um, yeah, you know, I've had to advise a lot of people in my career on whether or not to cut down a tree. Um, and arborists can very easily, can pretty readily assess the structural integrity of that tree. So how well is it going to stay standing and can kind of put a decent guess on how long. Um, the question always comes down to though, uh, what targets are underneath that tree? Um, so is it, is it over your house? You know, obviously that's, there's a target right under your house. Um, is it over uh, your car or your driveway? You know, uh, those are pretty obvious ones, but also think about, is it in a high traffic area where I walk through here a lot, where it's right over a path that maybe I don't walk through here every day, but sometimes I do. And so that's how I've kind of helped coach folks on when to make that decision. If it's, I have some ash trees in my front yard that aren't showing symptoms yet that much. I think last year I started to see them. Uh, they're far away from anything and probably anywhere we really are regularly at. So I think I'll probably keep those around for a long time. And similar to why Elizabeth appreciates hers, I love to see that woodpecker feeding action and, and just kind of watch. I mean, that's a part of nature. Trees die in the forest. Woodpeckers feed on the insects that come in. Um, you know, fungi in, infect that tree and start to decompose it. And it's just, you're seeing that process happen faster with ash trees. Okay. Okay, um, the next question is, do you have any witness trees in your park or area? Any what? Witness trees. It's like a historical tree. Well, so uh, witness trees are usually associated with um, some of the early land surveys. And so we're, um, you know, a record that when we surveyed the United States way back when, you know, in the days of the GLO, General Land Office, um, GLO surveys, uh, the surveyors would at, at set points record trees in their data. And so that's what I think of as a witness tree. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, do, do you have knowledge of any of that history of Hessel? I don't because um, I have seen a picture of the Hessel planting. I saw this just this last week. And I found that all of the trees were being planted at the same time and they were only about three foot high. Um, and that included those pin oaks. And so those pin oaks came from around 1918, 1920, which uh, I found very interesting. But um, wonderful question. And I mean, what a ton of history is tied up in those survey notes. You know, and, and I, in, in grad school, I actually looked at those with reference to what the original vegetation was. And so that's what a lot of researchers use that for. I wasn't necessarily looking at trees though. I was looking at what, what those surveyors recorded for other vegetation and giant cane was the species I was interested in, which is species of bamboo that's native to Southern Illinois. So um, it's actually allowed us to reconstruct some of these range maps of plants. Like we looked at a lot of native range maps. So, um, you know, that's helped us with that. Um, you know, some fossil records of, of pollen and things are, are what we built a lot of those prehistoric map, range maps and things from. So um, there's a ton of history tied up in, in trees and human interaction with trees, so. Cool. Okay, our next question is, how does soil type affect ultimate tree size, as you mentioned? Oh, and I've, we've kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, well, uh, you know, it, it it all depends on the tree and it all depends on the soil, I suppose, is where you kind of start that discussion. But um, uh, ultimately, um, if, you know, trees are adapted to certain soil conditions, they have some root systems can handle flooded soils and low oxygen, some root systems can't. So, you know, take our example of green and white ash, uh, green ash probably has a root system that's pretty adapted to low soil oxygen um, can handle compaction in the urban soil environment. You know, that's compaction creates low uh, soil oxygen and therefore is adapted to this wide range of conditions where it can grow. Again, we talked about that in a lot of different spots, um, but green ash is the further it goes up the slope and out of the bottom lens and that poor, those poorly drained areas, 
um, the less it's not going to do nearly as well. Uh, where a white ash on a more upland site, even though green ash might be able to grow there, that white ash is going to have the soil conditions that it likes, which are lots of oxygen, a well-drained soil, um, you know, all these things that you would get in an upland site, a dry, a relatively dry soil. And so white ash is going to get super tall on those sites. Um, so that's really how it affects it. And we know those relationships pretty well at this point. Um, you know, the USDA has done, has done an extensive soil survey of this country. So we know just about every place in the country what your soil, particular soil map unit is. And tied to that are measures of productivity that we call, as foresters, the term is site index. So that's how tall a tree can grow in a given amount of time. And so um, that's known for every soil. So it's, it's actually pretty easy to kind of interpret that information. And that's why, as a forester, before I ever went out to look at someone's woodland, I wanted to know what the site index was for that site, because that helps me interpret um, if a white oak is so big that helps me interpret um, how well it's going to do into the future, uh, where it's at in its life cycle, and um, just you can make a lot of decisions on managing your forest uh, based off of what you know about the soil types. Or managing the one or two trees that you have in your backyard, which is uh, more correct for most people, Ryan. Well, why don't we do one more question and then kind of wrap things up for tonight, but... Um, uh, we'll answer all the other questions. All right, so we have one good um, last question. Um, what is a fast growing native tree? Um, well, the, um, the yellow buckeye, no, that's not native to Illinois. So I won't <laughs> give you that example, although it grows beautifully rapidly. Um, what about the river birch? That grows very rapidly. Uh, that will grow like um, two or three feet a year. And actually, so will the pin oak. We spoke about that last time. And so there's a couple for you. Yeah, I, I really like river birch. That went, that's kind of my answer, standard answer to that question when somebody asks me what's a fast growing native tree uh, that could be a shade tree. It's, I, I like river birch a lot. and. They have a beautiful, beautiful multi-stemmed character where they, they kind of, you can have them as three or four stemmed mature tree. I just love that. Um, that and beautiful. somebody just sent in to say cottonwood. Cottonwood? And, yeah. Cottonwood's a very fast growing native tree. Um, I don't know that I would recommend it like I do a river birch. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think we could probably sit online and talk about trees all night if we wanted to. Um, but Elizabeth and I have really enjoyed having you all with us. Um, we will go through the chat box and provide an answer to all those questions that we'll email back out to you all. We got an email with your registration. So watch for that. Uh, watch for um, the posting of these recordings too. And um, can't thank you all enough for joining it. We had a wonderful crowd and, and what a blast it is to virtually do a tree walk. Thank you very much.